Hello, everybody. Welcome to this event co-hosted by the Fellows Program at New America and Future Tense. Future Tense is a collaboration between New America and Arizona State University, Go Devils, that explores the impact of technology on society. I'm Ed Finn, the director of the Center for Science and the Imagination at ASU and Future Tense's academic director. I'm delighted to be here today with Christine Rosen to celebrate her new book, The Extinction of Experience, Being Human in a Disembodied World. Christine is an alumna of the Fellows Program and a Future Tense Fellow. She's also a senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and a fellow at the University of Virginia's Institute for Advanced Studies in Culture. Welcome, Christine. Hi, Ed. Thanks for having me. I am delighted to be talking with you, uh, though we have to start by pointing out the irony that we are having this conversation over Zoom. <laughs> and yes, the, undermining the, so many arguments I'd like to make about this, face This soul-sucking, <laughs> disembodied void that we've all spent so much time on uh, over the past <laughs> few years. Uh, so uh, maybe to bring some humanity back into this at the beginning to, to salvage the, you know, the, the, the black uh, rectangles of doom surrounding us, what inspired you to write this book? You know, how are you thinking about the word experience here? Well, it, it's funny. I was uh, I've studied technology's impact on human behavior for a long time. Written a lot about the development of particularly personal technology, the smartphone, and uh, in particular. But what I noticed a few years back is that as the as the smartphone became sort of a Swiss Army knife for everyone's daily life, that we were spending more and more time uh, having experiences through our technologies rather than having them be tools that help us as humans have day-to-day -day human experiences. And then I had read a few years back an essay by a naturalist named Robert Michael Pyle, and he was talking about his concern about younger generations who grow up in a world where they don't encounter um, you know, the messy outdoor experience of getting their hands dirty, of seeing the natural world, of understanding ecosystems, and that if you raise a generation of children who don't have that hands-on experience with the world, they won't know what's missing when, say, a species goes extinct or an ecosystem dies. And it really stayed with me, this idea that there will be uh, future generations who don't understand what they've lost because we haven't actually accounted for it. So that started me down a sort of rabbit hole of thinking about all the day-to-day -day things that have been transformed by mediation, by using a screen uh, from face-to-face -face interaction to things we used to do with our hands, even to the way that we educate kids and the way that uh, we ourselves interact with our with our friends and loved ones. So. That's how it started, was just as a sort of question about what, what have we lost? Not because I want to give up technology, I use it every day, but just to sort of account for the things that have gone missing or extinct. Yeah, I was really struck a few years ago when one of my kids picked up a magazine and started trying to tap it, mm -hmm. you know, and scroll and mm -hmm. swipe. Uh, and many people have remarked on how quickly kids pick up these interface gestures and how intuitive that is. But it was just a sign of how quickly uh, and profoundly the experience of growing up and our experience of the world has changed when you do it in, in the mediated through all of these screens. So I guess uh, to follow up on this, this personal side of things, have, has this book changed how you think about your own face-to-face -face interactions? You know, what, how, if, if we're losing things, do you have uh, thoughts on how we can recover them or how we can move forward from here? Because uh, unfortunately, I don't think we're going to be able to, you know, just bury all the smartphones in a landfill somewhere. Right. Uh, so what do we do? Well, it's interesting. I uh, This is always the puzzle when you write a, a, a book that's sort of a critique, because then your your lovely editor will turn to his mind and say, OK, so how do we solve this problem? And I was trained as a historian. I'm like, wait, I'm just supposed to describe the problem, right? No, <laughs> But I did. I have actually thought both in my own uh, personal life, but also through interviewing uh, a wide range of people and a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, and some of this will sound mundane, but hopefully it's helpful. The, one of the things that for me personally was the most useful was noticing how often I filled interstitial time, you know, those little moments of the day where I was between work and home or commuting or waiting for something, how often I reached for my phone to entertain myself and distract myself. I figured, oh, I, you know, I study this stuff. I'm very aware. Well, I was shocked when I tried to go 24 hours without filling those little moments here and there with a phone. 
And so I decided to do a challenge and say, okay, well, let me try always not to reach for the phone first. And what I found is that I noticed a lot more about the, where I was at that moment. I also found my mind wandering in a very creative and productive way, uh, having ideas about things I was working on at the time. I also just was calmer because I wasn't getting a kind of constant stimulation. Now, th does that mean that I ignored texts from my children? No, I didn't do that. But so, so as a practical tool, the phone is still always there. But an, uh, cultivating awareness of how often we're choosing the mediated uh, way of living versus the real embodied face-to-face -face human interaction in the real world and how often we tune out the real world for our mediated worlds. That really, I think, is a, is a is the best advice I can give people is to start noticing how often you live that way and see if there's a difference uh, if you if you notice and then maybe change your behavior a little bit. Yeah, I've started to, I've never been a smoker, but I've started to think about smartphones as like cigarettes and a thing you reach for when you just need this quick hit and you're basically trying to escape the ennui and, and you know, stress of regular life. But uh, more often than not, the hit is just more stress and anxiety, right? Because it's some 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 other uh, entity or agent trying to colonize your attention and do mm -hmm. something with it and get you thinking about something else and spiraling off, spiraling off potentially or, uh, you know, thinking about buying something. So I, I really uh, uh, like what you're saying about um, it's the, the regaining control of your attention or having more inten intentionality about your mm -hmm. attention and what you're going to spend your time on. But also that idea of daydreaming, which I'm... Uh, a big fan of as well. I've spent a lot of time thinking about imagination. So uh, one thing that uh, one of my favorite chapters in the book was uh, your chapter about time and the whole idea of, of waiting. Uh, and I think you, you kind of uh, talked a little bit about this already and this, this idea that we're filling all of our interstitial moments. Um, but what do you think the larger consequences of this shift are when we're capturing every iota of attention? It's all being harvested by some social media company or uh, the, the, the tools that we're using are getting really efficient and effective at making sure that there, you know, there are lots of engineers whose job it is to maximize the amount of time we spend using their tool, right? So what, what do you see as the larger social consequences of that beyond just the the, the creating individual personal space for, for mind wandering? It's a great question because if you think about scaling, uh, scaling up that issue of impatience, I think a lot of us feel a little anxious and harried and like we're constantly living in the now and in the moment. The flip side of that is the huge convenience of being able to get things on demand, not having to worry about, you know, uh, the efficiencies uh, of some of the ways that we live our lives. But my concern is that it cultivates habits of mind in people that they then transfer to the rest of the real world. And by that, I mean, I started to look at things like the uh, increasing rates of road rage and air rage and vast cultural impatience, markers of impatience. And it's interesting to me because I have a lot of social science uh, friends who do a lot of quantitative analysis. They look at data and if it's not in the numbers, it doesn't exist. If you can't measure it, it's not real. So I come from the humanities. I'm, I look at more qualitative things, which can't always be measured in the same way. But I, I talk to a lot of people. I observe a lot of behavior. And I don't think there was anyone I interviewed or talked to over the last few years working on this book who didn't comment on how impatient people were. And it was different from rudeness, for example. It was just everyone's in a hurry and no one has time for pleasantries. And then you start to see creeping into discussions in the, cult, the sort of popular culture in general, well, who needs pleasantries? They're inefficient. And so there are these little shifts that happen here and there, but taken together, it's, it's a way of viewing the world as a place that should be as seamless and efficient and work for me as easily as possible. And that's all well and good until you run up against something you can't control and you can't push a button or swipe it away on your screen. And that's like, say, I don't know, a traffic jam or, you know, having to wait for your food to come out of a restaurant or having to wait in a waiting room of a hospital because a loved one is there. So these are habits of mind that we have to cultivate. We have to practice these skills. And I think they've been devalued in a, in a culture that wants us to feel like we can overcome some of our human limitations. 
And patience is an important virtue. And I do use the word virtue deliberately. I think we've lost sight of what the purpose of those are, not just for individual fulfillment and flourishing, but for how a society can get along when people disagree or when something goes wrong. So that's why cultural impatience matters. Think about legislation. If we have a problem that's going to take 10 years to solve and is quite complicated, if you have an impatient electorate, their representatives don't have much incentive to try to buckle down and, and start solving that problem. Yes, this is something else that I'm really interested in, our relationship with the future and long-term thinking. And there's an interesting seeming paradox here because you're talking about the immediate present, right? And our relationship with what is happening right now and suggesting that maybe if we change that relationship, it, it changes our relationship with the future as well. Uh, and I'm really interested. I love uh, you mentioned uh, Julian Bleeker's uh slow, the very slow messenger uh, yes. the tool that he made, uh, which is is sort of like a beeper or a text message system, uh, but it the, the message comes over the span of hours or days, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a suggestion also that the more emotionally fraught the message is, the longer it takes to show up. So uh, do you think that, uh, this? it reminds me a little bit of the slow food movement, Mm -hmm. you know, this idea we need to slow down. So do we need a slow news movement as well? We do. And in, in, in that sense, I think we have to sort of uh, reorient our thinking about waiting. Right now we see waiting as delay, but waiting can be something, uh, it can be about anticipation. And I think that's what the slow messenger attempts to do. I did uh, in the book, I did this very cliche thing that writers love to do. And I went to a monastery and, you know, for a week, a silent retreat, I, I'm literally rolling my own eyes because it is a cliche. But I went with all these expectations that I was going to learn about attention. I was like, they're going to show me how to focus and do. But the the message I received in in all of that silence and following the prayer schedule and doing everything as I was told to do, was how joyful all of the monks in this community were uh, with waiting because they are there for their entire lives waiting to hear the voice of God. And met, and the ones I spoke to said, well, I might never hear it, but I am just joyfully anticipating hearing it. And there was something about the joy that really struck me. They didn't see waiting as this horrible burden that they must overcome or, or develop an app for. They saw it as a, as a natural and indeed necessary part of understanding the community and the world they were building. So obviously we're not all monks, but we can start to see uh, waiting as, as an important um, uh, experience, something that actually, it teaches us something, but it might also be necessary for solving some of these more complicated social problems in a very polarized world. There's another fascinating juxtaposition there because part partially what I, I hear you saying is this notion that uh, when you pause, when you uh, when you wait, you you have to become comfortable with yourself, right? You have to be happy with who you are. And that for these monks, uh, there's this sense of joy in mm -hmm. just being present and just waiting for this thing that might happen. And uh, I want to come back to the idea of anticipation uh, because you, it's such, such a great one. But uh, that seems almost at odds with the idea of, of sort of emptying yourself out, right? That these uh, that as a monk, maybe you're supposed to be a vessel for the, the divine, right? That it's not about you. It's about mm -hmm. this larger, almost cosmic uh, idea connecting with something much bigger. Uh but it, it but it's working right for these 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 monks are happy and I want to hear were you happy were you there did you feel this yourself? So it took a few days. Um, uh -huh. My children were a bit younger at the time, so I, I at first I was like, "Am I happy because I don't have you know two young kids pulling at pulling at me left and right at, making demands?" But by day four, it was more peaceful happiness because first obviously many many distractions are, are disappear uh, the. It, for, for the economists uh, among us, um, I had fewer choices, which usually, again, we see as a negative thing, but I realized could be positive. You know, limiting the number of options you have actually can make you happier at certain stages of life. And um, just the slowness of time when it sunk in, and it does take a while, and people who go on retreats often often reflect on this, and then coming out of it, how noisy and and hectic and fast uh, the world seemed returning to it. And so it, again, 
understanding that you can you can put yourself in environments where time has a different pace and that that can be healthy and good and then trying to find those moments in your day-to-day -day life which are which is a real challenge um but you know it, it's 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 more of a challenge than just downloading the newest meditation app, although there are many good meditation apps. It's it's a practice. It's habit. Again, I keep coming back to very Victorian sounding things like habits and virtues, but our technologies are training us in certain habits and, and virtues. So the question is, when do we need to choose the human form of that over the technological? Because now we actually have to choose. It didn't used to be the case, but now in many, many moments of our lives, we have to choose the analog face-to-face -face human interaction over the technologically mediated one. Yeah, and so often that choice feels like something you have to make against the grain or exactly. push push back against this gravitational force that's pulling you towards, towards a particular set of choices. So getting back to the question, I interrupted my own question because I'm so <laughs> excited about this topic, uh, is the, the, this, the kind of selflessness that maybe you touched on when you were in this monastery and that these monks are practicing feels different from the, the the hollowing out of the self that I think you see in the sort of contemporary consumer society. And I think we've all felt it that, well, I'm, why am I going to reach for my phone? Because I'm anxious or maybe even afraid that I'm just, if I'm just stuck here in this room with myself right now, I'm going to be unhappy, right? So I want to, it's like you want this distress, that boredom uh, is a source of, of fear and anxiety. And so we reach for the distraction uh, or personally, because I, I hate lines, right? You know, it's so <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm on this line, I'm mad about it. So I can distract myself or I can be more efficient by, you know, right. getting something done that maybe I wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So our, how do we, how do we disentangle those two kinds of emptying out of the person? It's a, it's, a, it's a great question. Actually, on your line point, by the way, I got to read all this fascinating Q, it's called Q psychology, Q, Q U E U E, you know, the, the, basically the science of standing in line, um, of which the Disney World, uh, Walt Disney World people are kind of the genius uh, students of this science um, and practice it the, the most efficiently. But there are amazing tricks that you can build into waiting if you hate waiting in line. Like the, one of the examples I give in the book is uh, at an airport where people were complaining about having to wait in line for um, uh, their bags, right? Because the, the gate and the baggage claim were very close together. So the airport wisely was like, well, we'll just make it further. They have to walk further to the baggage claim. There, the amount of time between when they left the plane and got their bags was exactly the same, but they were only standing around waiting for a few minutes versus 10. So there is a psychology to it. But this erosion of a sense of self is really important. So in the 20th century, there were a number of cultural critics and sociologists, people like Christopher Lash, Irving Goffman, others, who had this sense that that modern society, and particularly Western consumer modern society, was making it more difficult for people to figure out who they were, right? They were they were taking all their cues from the outside world rather than developing inner uh, certainty about that. They were in they were not inner directed. They were other directed. They took everything from outside. Well, if you think about what kinds of behaviors and emotional experiences our social media platforms and technology platforms in general encourage us to do, it is to constantly perform ourselves from a very young age now for most most kids uh, in, in Western countries to perform a self before one has even fully formed. So what that I think creates is a lot of people who have a kind of fragmented sense of self and you read these sort of heartbreaking stories of young men and women who literally can't can't really connect to the face they see in a mirror because they're so used to seeing a filtered version on Instagram. And that's an extreme case, but 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 it speaks to a weird, unnerving sense that the development and formation of a healthy sense of self requires uh, some really old fashioned things, connections to people, uh, a correction of one's behavior when one you know steps over a line, learning from mistakes, friction, in other words. What does everything about our technological world encourage? Uh, frictionless behavior, seamless things, ease, convenience, immediate gratification. So in a weird way, I think I, I would, you know, I kind of wish Christopher Lash or Neil Postman, some of these guys could come back and look at where we are now and remind us that, again, it's difficult to quantify the development of a self, but it's a hugely important part of what it means to be a flourishing human being. And we've lost sight of that in pursuit of some other goals that I think we're only now starting to um, realize might not might not contribute to flourishing. So... Uh, you've now given me the opportunity to ask you about Disney World. Uh, 
and uh, I loved uh, it was a setup <laughs> descriptions. That's right, uh, descriptions of it. Uh, and Disney World and the Disney Corporation is indeed you know wizardly in their management of lines and making you feel like you're making progress. Uh, as juxtaposed with all of the terrible lines we've encountered, I was traveling with my family over the summer and we were trapped in a giant international airport with mm. a, the, the line that we called the line just for fun because it just sort of spiraled into the middle of this room for no <laughs> discernible reason. And then eventually you would get to the front and somebody would sort of bless you and permit permit you to then ascend an escalator to a different room. <laughs> And, Where you still waited. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was the, you know, right, but uh, there was it, it was you know there was sort of uh, the, the performance of it right was was poorly done. So uh, you're the, the way you talk about Disney World reminds me of Jean Baudrillard, the philosopher's famous take on Disneyland in the Simulacra and Simulation. Um, that it's not that Disneyland is fake; it's that the rest of the world is so hyper real, so out of you know, so so beyond normal reality that uh, Disneyland sort of makes it look better. You know, it blurs the boundaries between fiction and reality. Uh, and so do, are we losing touch with a shared reality as we put more screens and filters between us and direct lived experience? I think we are. And, and the Disney, um, it really did strike me when I went back to Disney with my own kids. So I was born and raised in Florida. So we would go all the time because we get these Florida cheaper tickets, you know, in the, when it's really, really hot and the tourists really don't want to bother. <laughs> um, and the old school, I'm Gen X. So I will, you know, I'll moan and, and cynically note how nobody understands us and how we had, we were, we were on top of this stuff early on. Uh, and roll my eyes at myself, but it we we did we were weirdly analog for important uh, stages of development, and then had to make the switch to digital. So I do think it gives people of my generation a, a, not a cynicism, but a healthy skepticism about some of this stuff. So when you go to Disney in the old days, you they would do the winding lines, which from Q Psychology teaches us keep people moving even a little bit, and they they're less likely to get too restless. Um, but that was about it. Like they just would, you know, you'd wait in line. We didn't, there was no fast pass or any of these wristbands or any of that stuff. But you go now and it is an unusual experience, not only to wait in line super long waits because they time things now and it's very efficient, but to ever wait in line without also being entertained while in line. So there's, you know, in some of the rides, you've got characters and screens, you've got stuff to watch. It's like you're inside a video game until you then get on the ride that is often linked to, you know, the Disney universe. And so is that bad? Uh, no, not necessarily because we don't spend our lives in theme parks, but what it reminded me of is our expectation in the real world, in the everyday world, which is, well, I should never be bored. I mean, I, I now when I'm paying a fortune to take my kids to Disney World, I don't want anyone to be bored because I'm paying good money for everyone to be entertained. But I do think we've, we've transported that expectation to our daily lives in a way that's unsustainable and also unhealthy. Um, particularly for younger uh, people who who shouldn't who should understand that the world does have hardships and things to overcome and and does not always respond to your demands. So that was what struck me about the Disney experience. Not that they've become ever more sophisticated at meeting our needs, and they understand that we don't want to wait anymore. They it's it's one of the major things they discuss in 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 the corporation. Like, what is their major complaint? It's that people don't want to wait in line for anything. They don't want to wait for anything when they come to the park. So I found that sort of fascinating, that that change. It is really interesting. And this, this also brings us back to anticipation in a way, because one of the uh, ironies of a place like Disney is that it is possible to have a bad time there. And, you know, you see weeping children, <laughs> you see <laughs> angry parents, people get really stressed out. Uh, and now, uh, because the, the experience is so mo much more technological and you're managing some kind of app and the wristbands mm -hmm. and the timing and the, yes. you know, depending on how deep you want to go into it, you know, all these uh, other uh, websites and research you can do about what's the best time to do certain things. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole logistical game you can turn into, turn the experience into, and then you can get really stressed out about that game. Or you can just right. be mad because you're stuck on a line, right? Or you, you're still uh, yes. having a bad time. Time. And uh, one of the things I, I loved in your book also is this uh, study uh, of, of a group of, of Dutch people around vacations and anticipation. Uh, and uh, the, the, the truth that is probably familiar to most of us that actually the anticipation of the thing is maybe more impactful than doing the thing itself. 
Um, yes. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about anticipation. Is that part of the the set of practices that you think we should be honing? Yes, and in, and I think it's important for two reasons. One, it because it helps us manage our expectations for what the real world experience might be. I think part of why we all love to plan things is that we're in charge and we're, we're thinking of all these amazing possibilities. Maybe a, maybe some of us who are a little more risk averse get the traveler's insurance and think, oh, things could go wrong. But largely, we're like, this is going to be amazing. You can sort of see the you know the kind of documentary photographs with the wonderful soundtrack of the vacation you're about to have in your mind. It's great. It's really fun. Then, of course, you get on vacation, the flight's delayed, the rental cars breaks down, you know, all kinds of things can go wrong. But there is at least you've had that experience of anticipating what it could be a sort of idealistic experience. I think what our technologies do is they actually want to um, colonize anticipation. So if you think about like search engines like Google and, and other sorts of anticipatory technologies, they want to guess what you want before you even type it. Now, in some cases, that's harmless. But in a lot of cases, like, say, planning something particular to you and your family or an event you want to go to, um, that can actually homogenize the experience. So if you're using, you know, your, your mapping technology and it knows that you like certain restaurants when you're at home, it maybe it only suggests that same cuisine when you're elsewhere. That means you might not notice restaurant. If, you're, if, you, if we become reliant on this managed experience because it's convenient and efficient, we will miss out on other kinds of experiences, which, yeah, might go wrong, but also make us make for more human interactions. And... The other part of anticipation that I think is worth understanding, and this is more in the context of things like live performance, uh, music, comedy, uh, artwork, uh, museums, is that when we slow down and we actually, you know, are patient enough to wait and be open to a new experience, we're also demonstrating humility. So if I, you know, I could look at a digital image of a, of a painting and never go to that museum, um, but I'm unlikely to really look at it, to sit and spend time and think, what is this artist trying to tell me? The same thing if somebody, I have a couple friends who are comedians, it's very different if I go to their show and I'm on, you know, checking my email the whole time, right? And so lots of artists now make you put that phone away and it's a different experience. If you've, if you've had both, you know, there's a qualitative difference. So there's a kind of humility baked into waiting and being open to that experience without distraction that I think is also important. So... This also brings up another, I think this, this uh, notion of colonizing and reframing cuts both ways because the future and the past are both these places of imagination that we think about. And it reminds me of a phrase that we've adopted in our family uh, from some friends of ours. Is this going to be a vacation or an experience? Mm. Uh, you know, and, and sometimes the, the struggles and the trials and tribulations are part of what make it interesting you know, and, and that's what the, the terrible experience on your on your trip or your adventure is what makes the great story later on. Exactly. And the thing that you yeah. actually remember rather than the painting that everyone else has already has also seen or, you know, and the, that you're taking the same picture with your smartphone that 10 million other people have taken with their smartphones. So do you see this kind of uh, colonization or reframing of the past happening as well? Because one thing I notice is that because all of our attention is, is absorbed in the present and the now and the constantly refreshing feeds and all of that. There is no time to reflect on what has happened or do things like practice gratitude, sticking with our Victorian virtues theme for the day. Uh, so uh, do, you, do you see that as well? Is that something that you came out in your research? Yeah. One, one thing that was fascinating to me was how, um, how to put this, uh, how much our technologists want to manage our own memories. And I mean that in two senses. First of all, there are lots of companies that are eager to mine even your sleeping moments, your dreams, like dream mining, things like this. These are not dystopian futuristic scenarios or utopian, depending on your sensibility. They are things that are in the works. Um, and so both for history, for, for our own individual past, uh, wanting to sort of the, even the way that that photo uh, apps will display prompts to memory are curated in particular ways. 
And this question of whether we actually go back and, as you say, reflect and, and appreciate what we did in the past in the same way we did when it was harder to capture those moments. Um, that really worries me just as a, as a, from a historical perspective, because our memories are being curated. There are now, um, there are now these tools where if you say you and your grandmother always wanted to go to Disney together, but she passed away before that ever happened, but you have a picture of your grandmother, you can send it to a company that will now create an actual photograph of you and your grandmother at Disney world together. Um, and, uh, it becomes a tangible, they can, you can print it out. It'd be a tangible document of something that never happened that you would have liked to have seen. So think about what that would do at scale for the ability to study the past. If you're a historian for, for the verifiability of historical artifacts. So there's that whole issue, but then think about future stuff. If someone you love dies, you can now harvest their voice, send it off to a company that will create a chat bot using their voice and you can talk to your dead loved one for as long as you want. Um, and it can get quite personal because you can allow them access to your dead loved one's email and they can sort of harvest data from there. Um, does that allow us to understand and appreciate human limitation and to truly grieve because that is part of the human experience? I think that's also worrisome because it never allows the dead to die in the same way that for a for a you know goofy junior high student, their past can never die if they put it on social media, even when they're 40 years old. So these are these are deep questions that I think we, we are just starting to wrestle with. And the technology is way ahead of us. So we have to talk about them now. Yeah, there's this kind of terrifying timelessness to it's as if time has all been taken and squashed onto mm -hmm. a I don't know what the right metaphor is you know I'm imagining a slide in a microscope mm -hmm. um, but it's all there in the present and it's all fungible and renegotiable and editable you know there's no sense of a a, a history that st stays in the past and a future mm -hmm. that we're looking forward to it's all just well what do you want to do right now uh, and it right reminds me of your description of that teenager looking at themselves in the mirror and not recognizing who they are because we anchor ourselves through these these points you know we mm -hmm. we, we need an arc humans I, I believe strongly that we're storytelling animals and the story needs to have a beginning and a middle and an end uh and you know you have to have all the pieces you have to have a sense of the trajectory to really make sense of what's going on so let me ask where are we headed? Do you think we're getting any better at dealing with the cognitive impact of these new technologies? Are they evolving faster than we are? What's ha what's going to happen next? The technology is definitely way ahead of us in terms of um, evolving in the sense that um, uh, our technologists are very good students of human behavior and human nature. And I do believe there is something that we can kind of vaguely call human nature. And they know what makes us tick. What we don't understand is that much of the stuff that we use merely for convenience or connection is actually designed to keep us staring at it for all kinds of other reasons, some perfectly harmless, some nefarious. Um, in the case of an unfree society, obviously for surveillance uh, by perhaps uh, not uh, ill-intentioned uh, government bureaucrats, um, as we have seen in China. But uh, for me, the main concern is that we are habituating ourselves to types of daily behavior that are not exactly quantifiable, but that are real. And we'll, we wake up one day and look at our lives and are like, why is every why is there a loneliness epidemic? Why, are, why is everybody so uncivil? Why is there no sort of active, thriving public square where people from different backgrounds can meet in person and everyone's not just staring at a computer screen or a phone? Well, it's because we chose it, but we chose it incrementally and we didn't even realize we were choosing against what came before. So, I mean, I have a I have a whole screed in there about handwriting because that to me was kind of a perfect example of we had this well-intentioned goal of teaching kids important keyboarding and computer skills because computers are the future. So we cast aside teaching a lot of handwriting and, and cursive, eliminating it entirely in, in many schools. And everybody thought that was an improvement, but we now know from research and sort of reflecting on it that that's not the case. We did, we threw aside stuff that was important for memory formation for literacy for all kinds of stuff so making those choices more um uh, with more awareness i think is important and and dialing back our embrace of technology in some of these situations also important look i i mean in the classroom for example i think it's very promising that lots of schools are saying you know what cell phones out bell to bell no cell phones 
Um, there's obviously a big debate, lively debate about and social policy world about age limits for social media. And those are that's good. People are having these conversations now. There's a lively um, debate in our house. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. No, I, no, I know. I wrote I wrote a piece about how 16 would be a great age limit for to keep, you know, kids should have to be 16 to be on social media when my kids were, I think, 14. And they were like, this is a terrible article. It's the worst thing you've ever written. I'm like, oh, fair enough. But the, but these things actually, that is optimistic. The thing I gain the most optimism from, though, is watching Gen Z. Um, these kids watch the millennials spend way too much time with technology, and they've heard all the warnings, and they themselves grew up with all of it. And they are often choosing more analog experiences. They have this game where they all go out to dinner. They put their phones in the middle of the table. Whoever picks up the phone first pays for dinner. They want to try to, they're trying to recreate and find again some of those face-to-face -face experiences. And that's important. And we should really encourage that. That's, that's an optimistic sign. But they're up against a lot. We all are. I mean, you have to actively choose the human thing day to day. You, you just have to be aware that you have to make that choice if, if it's important to you. Yeah, I completely agree. And uh, I want to start bringing in, speaking of humans, some of the other people <laughs> who are here and their questions. So uh, we've got uh, a few of them here. And if anyone would like to add one to the mix, please uh, do so. Uh, but I'll start with one question uh, here. Uh, what is a simple thing we can do in our daily lives to consciously be more in touch with our humanity? Um, okay, I'll give two answers, which is annoying. The first, don't pick up your interstitial time. Don't pick up your phone and fill it. Just be an in interstitial time, those moments when you're waiting. More importantly, um, choose face-to-face -face interaction whenever possible. Choose to look at the human in the checkout line and say something to them. You know, if you get your Starbucks mobile order uh, four days a week, on the fifth day, go into the Starbucks, speak to the person who makes your coffee and say a few words. Just, again, make an active effort to have face-to-face -face interaction with other people um, obviously your loved ones, but strangers in public space. Try to be a good citizen. Try to be a person who interacts with others and gives those those very small but important gestures of respect to other people. Yeah, I think those are great. And uh, this uh, connects to another question from Mia, uh, who says that her antidote to the phone reach distraction is people watching. Airport lines, for example, are an incredible place to observe human behavior. So is it time to bring back live people watching as a replacement to the Instagram, you know, social media mediated version of that? Yes, I love this. <laughs> and, you know, it's such a good idea. Some corporations going to want to make an app for it called people watching and then they're going <laughs> to. like. So I say, yes, the old fashioned people watching. It's how. I mean, from I spent some time reading lots of stuff that Darwin did and other other observers of humans who try to understand over time why we do what we do. And some of their most brilliant insights come from doing just that, watching how people behave. We are interesting, fascinating, weird creatures, and it should be um, very revelatory. Novel good novelists do this, too, like just observing how humans interact. Very important. You also learn something about yourself, like you learn to read other people better because you've seen a range of human behavior that gets flattened when, when it's on the screen. Yeah, I am fascinated by the little things people do. You know, For example, watching other people be bored and how they cope <laughs> with that, right? As a, you, you can think it's to a yourself- A lot of fidgeting. Oh, do I wanna <laughs> be in that person's <laughs> shoes or not? Or, right, who is having the worst time on this line right now? You know, <laughs> right. uh, can, can we help that person? <laughs> Uh, so uh, this this does bring up another interesting point uh, from from a, another question asker. Uh, it feels like pauses, taking these pauses, are a luxury when people are worried about affording food and shelter, taking care of these basic necessities, uh, delays that prevent us from working or being with family uh, or in investing and learning. Uh, not everybody maybe has the the resources, the temporal or the whatever financial environmental resources do to do that. So is there a literal opportunity cost uh, to some of this? What are your thoughts? Yes, there absolutely is, depending on the kind, the type of job you have, the type of employee and employer relationship you have. And this is something that I think doesn't get discussed enough. Um, if you're either if you're an entry level employee without a lot of seniority or you're in a, a kind of job that requires hands on work where you're managed by other people, you don't get control of your time and the luxury of having jobs. I, I happen to have one, so I appreciate it. You have a job where you actually get to control what you do and when you do it. That is not the experience of many, many working people in this world. So 
one thing that I think is important is that when we think about technology and what we can do to make it more humane and use it more humanely, we should start in schools and in the workplace, because those are two places that have that are that tend to eagerly embrace the new new thing and think it's going to be an improvement. And you know what it often is for the shareholders, but it really can have consequences for employees where their choice and their range of freedom is limited. They're surveyed more because it's possible to be surveyed more. Every keystroke on their computer is monitored. If you're a long haul trucker right now, you have in many, for many companies, you're wearing a hat with sensors that alert someone at a, a facility at the trucking company if you're starting to fall asleep or if maybe you've had too much caffeine or something you shouldn't have. Now, it's all done in the range of safety, efficiency, all of these tools, but it's turning human beings into cogs in a machine that doesn't benefit the people who are doing the work. And in that sense, I think there have been, you know, there have been a lot of books written about, you know, surveillance capitalism and all this other stuff. Those are important. But if you're an employee, it means uh, there's a collective action issue, right? Other employees need to come together and say, you know what, we don't want money off of our health insurance plan if we slap on a smartwatch that monitors our physical uh, signals, because it doesn't just monitor your steps, people. It monitors a lot more and can tell a lot more. So that's going to be a bottom up movement, a workers movement. And you see it in some industries that are being transformed by technology. But it's an it's a really important point. I wasn't able to get into all of those dynamics in the book, except to say what the technologists want, what they would tell people who are in that situation is what Mark Andreessen told a lot of people, which is, well, your reality kind of sucks. So whenever you do have free time, just slap on some VR goggles and live the life you can't have in the real world. Live it online. That's their solution to this problem. I think we need to fix fix the real world uh, rather than shunt people off into the virtual one. Yeah, I completely agree. And one of the things that I see you uh, talking about is, or the, the lens that I bring to this conversation about um, the kind of cognitive freedom, let's say mental freedom in a workplace or yes. a structured and formal environment, like a formal learning environment, is uh, I think of, it, think of it in terms of imagination. Uh, and so much of our formal educational system those first jobs are all about pounding your your willful imagination out of you and saying, you know, pay attention, sit at this desk, do this, don't daydream, focus mm -hmm. on this task. We want to control not just your physical be behavior, but your cognitive behavior, right? And we're going to sort of condition you to do things in a particular way. And, you know, it's not that that's intrinsically bad. You know, we want everybody to learn how to read and write. We want to build a sort of cohesive sense of society and articulate the values that and, and uh, that we think are are the right ones that should be shared. Uh, but it's pretty easy to go too far. And the more you turn people into cogs, the less they are going to be imaginative. They're going to be creative. Uh, they're going to open up, you know, these doorways that uh, wouldn't have occurred to anybody else. So I guess uh, if you, I don't know if you, you have any reactions to that, if that's something that you think about, that this isn't that not only is efficiency uh, sometimes problematic, or it shouldn't be a sort of a, a monolithic goal for mm -hmm. really any organization, but that you're that there are these trade offs with other things that might actually make that organization more resilient or more successful. Yeah, it's funny, you know, when you hear the debates about older uh, employers complaining about their young employees, it's like, oh, they want a mental health day or oh, they need yoga, they need to do their yoga, they, they want to work from home all the time. On, on the one hand, I have some sympathy with that because I think about some of my entry level jobs and I'm like, what are these? These kids are crazy. Who do they think they are? But on the other hand, they are they're expressing in a way the way that they know how a version of that feeling of being uh, turned into cogs um, and a lack of cognitive liberty. So this is a phrase that the founders of this country never thought they would ever have to say. But it is a real thing in, in law. Anita Farahay has a great book about, you know, sort of your mental freedom that came out last, I think, last year. It's great. Um, in legal circles, if you're going to go to law school soon, make cognitive liberty your your sort of specialization. You're going to have a lot of work in the, in the future because the monitoring of, of this, the thing, the exhaust that we give off when we're using our brains, because I don't think it's actually um, uh, quite right that they can read our minds yet. That's what they're promising companies that they want to buy their technology, but but it doesn't matter. It's just the monitoring in general is a, is a huge um, blow to freedom. And if we're gonna 
have that as the value because it leads to greater productivity and greater efficiency, then you're going to really sacrifice your workforce. And long term, that's a terrible strategy because you can't outsource all this stuff to AI. You can't outsource it all to technology. You need human beings and you actually have to treat them in a decent way if you want them to, to be productive long term and to have a healthy, creative uh, workplace. Yeah, ultimately, it comes back to this question as a fellow humanist. What, what the point is to have a you know a, a good world for human beings to exist in. It's not you know we we could. Uh, I had a conversation with a a student doing research on AI in the university and saying, well, we were having this sort of theoretical conversation about, well, should this you know would you just replace your professor with AI? You know, the more that the professor is using AI to teach the class, at a certain point, you don't need the middleman anymore, just have the students interact with the AI. But then the logical endpoint of that is, well, you don't need the students either, right? We'll just have this, this virtual environment. Right. You can have student AIs and you can have a professor AI and they can all just keep <laughs> chatting at each other forever. Uh, so the efficiency in that sense, you know, takes us down this kind of nihilistic pathway. So uh, let me, do we have time for maybe one or two more questions from, uh, from the audience? So one is about uh, smart watches, which I think is interesting. How would you characterize the role of the smart watch in our collective disembodiment? You know, these notifications that pop up, uh, you know, is is that is that is that any different from a phone? Is a watch is maybe something you can more organically integrate into something that you're doing, or is it basically the same? So that was the promise of the watch, remember, when it came out. And in fact, I had several friends who were early adopters of anything like this. And so they instantly got it. And they're like, now you can't tell me to put my phone away because it's on my watch and I won't <laughs> be so distracted. Uh, I mean, they knew they were distracted. And I got to tell you, this is just as bad as this. I, I'm looking for the like I'm lo looking at the watch. And, and then, of course, because the early adopters tend to be people who can afford the expense of the new technology. They're older, so they can't see it. So they're like staring. <laughs> and in a weird way, it becomes more distracting because it, it it's on their wrist and they get the notifications. One other thing I would say about that is that I think the quantified self movement, which got a lot of attention when it first came on the scene and the, you know, tracking your steps and oh, this will be great for health. The more you know about how you act, your physical body is moving, the healthier will I'll be. True enough. But these watches and the sensors that have that are coming down the pipeline, the ones that can be embedded in your employee badge, for example, they can tell you a lot more than just the steps you're taking. They are incredibly sophisticated. They can monitor heart rate. They can monitor galvanic skin response, i.e. if you if when your boss walks in the room and asks you a question, you have a flop sweat. <laughs> I mean, like it, and and is the question I have for people is. How much are you actually, how much self-knowledge are you really gaining from these tools? And is it worth the trade-off of the amount of information you're making available maybe to your to your uh, boss, but also to the companies that are then selling your data? Because we do in this country have a lot of privatized data markets that that your, your smartwatch habits can end up being sold to a health insurance company down the line. That is not a scenario that's um, implausible. So... I, again, the trade-off is important. I think the watches are just as distracting as a phone because it takes you away from your face-to-face -face interactions. And so in that sense, they pose a similar social challenge. Uh, I, I totally agree. I think that most of us have really no idea what kind of a deal we're making when we start to use some of these technologies and the and it because it's largely secret right, it, it, right. People, it's not disclosed what right. kinds of information are being gathered and how they're how it's being used who it's being sold to and uh even someone who could try to answer that question today has no idea what what might happen with that data which lives forever 10 years from now so I, to give you one example of this, I wrote an article years and years ago for the New Atlantis when the first genetic, private genetic testing companies came out. And I said, you know, this is like, th there are many ways in which this will be helpful, but there's also this risk, which is that we don't, what if a comp company goes bankrupt and what happens to your genetic data, which is very, so then fast forward, what, 15 years, 23 and me, which a lot, I know a lot of people who did that cheek swab and got their, you know, genetic thing and thought that was the neatest, coolest thing ever. And now what happens now that that company is in a, in a state of crisis? What happens to that genetic information? So we have so many examples where really sensitive information about ourselves that that we should have the power to control and share is out of our out of our control. And getting it back is very difficult, but we can we can try to stop it before we got to stop it at the at the choke point. You know, before we slap that watch on our wrist, we should see what the terms and conditions are really committing us to do. 
but it is really difficult, difficult, right? Because it requires yeah. a kind of monastic relationship with the world to say, oh, I'm right. going to abstain from all of these things that everybody is using. And sometimes it's simply impossible. Exactly. Uh, maybe not with a smartwatch, that feels like a choice, but you know, yeah. some of these things are different. Uh, so this is kind of a, a devil's advocate question, which I'll preface by saying it reminds me of uh, uh, the Plato and the Phaedrus complaining about how writing is going to ruin everything. Uh, yes. <laughs> so what about, what do you think about reading a book or, or a paper newspaper while standing in line? Is that better? Uh, it's still taking your, no, I mean, not if your argument is that you actually need foul. And I would make this argument that you need, your mind needs time to be fallow for one mm. thing. And if you're in public space, be in public space, look around and see what's going on. Now, if you're at an airport and you've been like hanging out and they say your flight will be delayed four hours, you're going to need a distraction. So obviously I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, this isn't an either or it's a, it's a, an awareness and selection of things that are important. So people have all kinds of ways of distracting themselves. They're, they're these guys who used to do worry beads, they're like things you can do to just pass the time, but you, you take those up, uh, with awareness and you use them in moderation. And that is not what we do with our phones. And actually, once you open a book, you'll finish it and set it down. And you know what? No one's reading you while you're reading the book, unless you're on a Kindle. If you're reading a paper book or a paper newspaper there, as you said, time horizons, matter. there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. And it's also a private experience. I think we should be having fewer private experiences in public because I think it makes us better people to be in public with other people. That said, sometimes you're going to want to distract yourself if you, you know, have a delay. But try to find those moments where you feel the urge and you resist it, because that makes that that builds character, it builds judgment, it builds awareness. Uh, I think that's a, a great point, and uh, that brings me to this last question, which feels like uh, the, bringing us uh, full circle back to the beginning of this conversation about uh, the ubiquity of Zoom and video meetings, and how has that changed? The way we show up at work and engage with coworkers, uh, it seems like it promotes a sort of hyper self vigilance and the sensation of being observed all the time. I know I usually turn off the self view when mm -hmm. I'm doing Zoom because uh, it, it, there's a specific cognitive load associated with just you know seeing yourself represented in this digital screen. But what do you think? So there was some fascinating research that came out right after the pandemic. Um, that was that looked at um, time horizons, memory, and experience. Where, uh, if to summarize it very uh, rudimentarily, um, there when you have the same sort of experience through the same medium, but it's very different life events. So think about how we all live during the pandemic, or those of us who were lucky enough to take our jobs on, do our jobs on Zoom, and weren't you know essential workers out in the world. So I, there was a day I, I wrote it down because I was like, why do I feel so weird where I had, so I did a podcast with my podcast buddies and then I had two work meetings um, and then I went to a bar mitzvah online and then I met up with a bunch of friends and then I did like a Zoom cocktail hour with some work colleagues um, and then I had a call with a, a family member at the end of the day, all on Zoom, all of me sitting in the same place. And a week later, I had trouble remembering the events and this is what the research found. We are, it's about embodied cognition, really, right? We are embodied physically and our bodies and our minds work in conjunction. So when we're just using Zoom, we're not using everything about moving from place to place so that our memory doesn't anchor in the same way. If I'd gone to the synagogue and gone to the bar mitzvah, I would have a different memory of it, a more formative memory. We know this about the way the brain works. So what Zoom does is flatten our time horizons, which compromises our memory. and in a pinch, like a pandemic, it's a, it's a lifesaver, right? But when we start to choose that over actually getting up, getting dressed, going to the office, sitting around, where again, spontaneous serendipitous interactions can lead to creative solutions to problems. That's, and also you get to hear the office gossip in a different way than you would if you were doing it on text. Um, it's important, those are important. So Zoom is a tool, but if we start to choose it in place of the face-to-face, -face, we will lose something important. And I think that's where, um, again, we have to we have to make the choice that might seem more difficult because long-term it's what's best for us. Yeah, I completely agree. And it, it brings to mind another one of these words that is in the background of this conversation, serendipity, just opening yourself up to the unexpected possibilities when you let yourself get out there into the world with all of its weirdness and strange collisions and happenstance. 
I hope that we all remembered this conversation. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much and congratulations on the book. And uh, thank you everybody for joining us and for your wonderful questions. Uh, Christine, it was lovely to see you and you uh, best of luck. Thanks so much. It was great to, great to talk to you again. Take care. Bye all.